Hi there! My name is Keenan Taylor. I am a scientific illustrator and speculative fiction author. I have a published anthology of short stories and novellas set in Chimere, and I'm currently working on a manuscript of a novel and a book series in the same setting. I've compiled these questions from my followers and subscribers over the past week or so. Given that I got over 100 questions, I will not be able to answer them all today and plan on doing another Q&A soon. Unlike my usual videos, this one won't be that formal, it's not terribly scripted, and will be pretty much all in one take. I've put all of these questions from various platforms into a single document, aside from the speed round questions from my Instagram story. If I did not get to your question today, it will be answered either next time, it's too similar to another question, or I may have decided to make a whole video on the subject as the sentence or two that I will try to dedicate to each response was insufficient to cover it. Although, full disclosure, I have ADHD and there's a tremendous amount of lore for Chimere, so I will probably be rambling in many of my replies. I've really only read over them once or twice to make sure that they are relevant and appropriate, although I think they all were, so thank you all for that. Today's format will be me reading about uh, 20 of the questions, and then the speed round from the short questions submitted on Instagram will follow. Let's go! Alright, here is our first question. So how exactly does the teleporting of the satellites work? I get that the cells copy the data of any creatures living at certain points in time and are sent back to Chimere. But there are times where I think you imply that some of the creatures are actually physically teleported to Chimere. So if you could give some specifics, that would be great. So oftentimes I will say in posts, and I describe it in the text itself as teleportation because that is the impression that the humans of Chimere have of what is happening. They don't know that it functions basically like a 3D printer, while on Earth it consumes an organism, copies down the data, and then has basically the, the portal in Chimere print an organism that it has consumed. So oftentimes I will say teleportation, but that's really just kind of a, a literary shorthand, if you will, to uh, convey how the humans in Chimere perceive it to be. It feels like teleportation because they retain all of their items and everything when they go from one end to the other, and they retain their memories and everything. So it is functionally teleportation, but in practice, it's still the 3D printing, basically, where on Earth it consumes and copies, and then in Chimere it prints a replication, if you will, of said organism. In the history of Chimere, have there been some type of ungulate carnivores related to Andrusarchus or Entelodonts, or more specifically descended related species from them? Yes, uh, the Nahashet of the prairies north of the Empire is an Entelodont, a more cursorial Entelodont than is, to my knowledge, known from the fossil record but there are also a lot more robust ones similar to our more conventional understanding of intelodonts in the eastern continent. And for those who don't know what an intelodont is, it's basically a land hippo that was very common and uh, dangerous, iconic uh, omnivores from... <sighs> I'm going to out myself as not knowing exactly when they were. I think it was about 30 million to 15 million years ago. They were found throughout Eurasia and North America. But I could be wrong on some specifics, so paleo folks, feel free to ridicule me in the comments. Three questions. What inspired this project in the first place? How did the Megaraptorans outcompete the giant Dromes and Abelosaurs? What's out there looking outside the known world? Hmm. All right, first one. What inspired this project in the first place? Uh, when I was 12, I was assigned to create a fantasy island, and I did so and decided that it was populated by dinosaurs and fairies or elves, and it all kind of grew from there, a uh, passion for writing and creature design built what is now, ten years later, uh, the project of Chimere. 
So for the second question, following the dynastic extinction that saw most of the tyrannosaurs and chimera go extinct, uh, there was kind of a, a power vacuum, if you will, and suddenly the role of gigantic theropod apex predator was open. So three different groups each presented a prototype of what their apex predator would be. The Eudromaeosaurs, or the raptor dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, presented a big Giganotosaurus-looking creature. The Abelosaurids, which is the group that includes Carnotaurus, um, also presented a 40-foot-long giant uh, sauropod hunter. And the Megaraptorans, which were a group before then of uh, 15 to 20 foot long uh, mid-range predators um, also presented several large options for this niche and the Megaraptorans ended up being more successful in large part because they were able to exploit a wider range of prey. They were not extremely specialized. I suppose the Eudramaeosaurs were too, but the Megaraptorans just happened to be more successful. You see this all the time in, in our own evolutionary history. Two different clades of animals have pretty similar matchups, and just one of them happens to be more successful. I will get more into the details of that in my Megaraptoran video. And lastly, what is lurking outside in the known world? An entire world. Uh, the known world that I talk about in Chimere that these stories all take place in is about the size of North America. So there's an entire planet of organisms that have been evolving in their own directions in the years following the first introduction of Earth life to Chimere. So it gives me a tremendous amount of opportunity to explore really weird stuff. The known world is is quite defined by the way the influx of mammals in the past 15 million years or so. Uh, so there's a lot more familiar organisms uh, in that region. Um, but as I begin to develop the rest of Chimere, the rest of the planet, we're going to see a lot more truly bizarre things. And some of them have immigrated into the known world. Uh, they just are not as common. Most of the things there are either dinosaurs or Cenozoic mammals that came fairly recently in geological terms. What sparked your interest in prehistoric animals and evolution? And also, when did this happen? Were you a very young child, or was it more recent? My first word was fossil, specifically fossa. So my passion for dinosaurs is about as old as I am. So it just sort of made sense to incorporate them into my literary work. What is your favorite thing about creating a fictional world? All of it. Um, <laughs> I, I love the creature design. I like extrapolating how being in a new setting would influence the way that cultures, languages develop. Um, I, I really enjoy thinking about characters and how growing up in this world would impact their own worldviews and values, things of that nature. If you were able to wish for one of the animals that you have come up with to become real and live in our world, what would it be? Hmm. Oh, that's a tough one. I'm going to have to go with the large titanosaurs. Which may be a bit of a cop-out, since they were real animals, but just the idea of seeing something so massive. These giant sauropod dinosaurs walking around would just... Uh, <laughs> breathtaking would be the word I would use for that. Sometimes in your posts, you say there is a barrier in the equator for some animals like mosasaurs and elasmosaurs. 
That is a great point. So this is something that came from a conversation that I had with one of the cetacean experts I've been speaking with as I develop the whales of the known world. And he mentioned that there's this theory that a lot of cetacean evolutionary biologists have that for a lot of history, the equator was too warm for a lot of whales to cross back and forth. And part of the reason that we see so many kind of northern and southern versions of different whales, like the, the northern right whale and southern right whale, sperm whales and humpbacks and blue whales were all able to cross back and forth during the Ice Age. Basically, the Ice Age made it cold enough that they could cross the equatorial barrier. That is not the case in Chimere. It is still too warm for a lot of whale species to go north. So while in the south, kind of in the known world, which is in the southern hemisphere, you have humpbacks and sperm whales and a few other different species, they are not as easily capable of migrating north of the equator. So some of them are very restricted to the south because the equator is too warm for them to cross up. An example that he gave was that Leviathan seems to have been restricted to our own southern hemisphere and was too large, essentially, and, and was basically too large and it was too hot for them to cross the equator. So I've kind of applied that idea to Chimere. How would you react and feel about a Chimere movie if it were ever to be made? I would love that. The Lost Hellfighter novel that I'm working on now, I think, could make a really fun movie or maybe a TV series. Definitely the Tales of Chimere short story anthology would not translate well to a film, but if Netflix wanted to pick that up, that would be... <clears throat> Are you into linguistics? Are there cultures outside of the known world of Chimere? And also, do you have any conlangs to showcase the languages in Chimere? I'm very into linguistics. In my linguistics course at undergrad, the final was to make a conlang. And that was when I developed the Picardiant language. And so I kept the notes of that and used them to develop about a dozen basics of a variety of different Chimeran languages. I don't have any that are fully speakable, but I have enough that when I'm designing creatures, I will select where that creature is most common and use the vocab list that I have from those people to develop their name. Animals that are throughout the known world, obviously, are going to have a different name in, in different languages. Very passionate about languages, and it's something that I plan on doing a video or two on the languages of Chimere and how I have developed it. Again, at least the basics of them. None of them are fully speakable languages, but I have the basics of all of them, enough to make creature names and character names. Two questions. Is the teleportation process a painful one? From what you've described, it sounds like it would be. Yes, yes, it, it is, but oftentimes when you are replicated, you are replicated without the memory of it. It's sort of a self-preservation component that the portal has added, because the whole point of bringing organisms to Chimere is to terraform the planet. So they don't want animals and plants coming to this coming to their world distress. So they basically erase the last bit of memory that you have when you're sucked in. So no one remembers how agonizingly terrible the process is, which I guess is pretty cool. You've mentioned that every so often, the portal will transport Earth species for hundreds of thousands of years. How often do Earth species come to be invasive on Chimere? Or does this happen frequently enough for Chimere and wildlife to adapt without issue? It is dependent on how the portal, uh, the endemic life of Chimere that has created these portals and is also the portals themselves, how they feel like Chimere is doing in basic terms. So if Chimere is stable as it was from about 70 million years ago to about 15 million years ago, there's not going to be much uh, collection. Um, once things settled down on Chimere and, and things were fairly ecologically stable, 
there wasn't a whole lot of collection of organisms from Earth. It happened maybe a dozen times throughout the dynasty of the Tyrannosaurs, Hadrosaurs, and Ceratopsians. Once the mass extinction happened that wiped out most of those three clades, suddenly there was a need to replenish the megafauna that the portal sent a request to their colony on Earth to send a bunch of little satellites out to collect a bunch of organisms to replicate and put on Chimere. Um, as anyone who is familiar with the concept of invasive species know, this made Chimere for the past 15 million years or so an extremely volatile place. Um, the known world is built around this intersection of over time, three different large continents have sort of come together to create this region known as the Known World, and it is extremely volatile ecologically because of this influx. So, no, Crimean life has not really adapted to it. It's why animals like the leopard that can adapt to a variety of different diets are much more successful, and why animals like the koala bear that has a very specific diet and is hyper-specialized has gone extinct on what, after it was introduced to Chimere because to survive in this volatile region where three different continents have come together, each bringing their own invasive species, combined with Earth <laughs> dumping a bunch of flora and fauna every few thousand years or every few million years has made this a place that in order to be successful you have to be adaptable. What was the creative process that went towards the beasts that populate Chimere? To be more specific and to have an example, what inspired the Parxosaurs? I'm dying to know since these guys in my opinion are extremely creative and imaginative. They're what convinced me to buy your book for myself. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm always happy to hear that people are excited about this project and want to know more by getting the book. Uh, it means a whole lot to me. So thank you for that. Parxosaurs I developed as a concept because in times of extinction, because it is a recurring trend in our own biological history that when times are tough and the context changes, organisms that are specialized for that context are almost always the ones that die out. Apex predators are extremely vulnerable to changes in context. And it is often the small, humble, adaptable organisms that emerge from mass extinctions and repopulate the world undergoing this phenomenon called adaptive radiation where they quickly evolve different attributes to fill different niches. You see this for example with mammals after the dinosaurs went extinct most of the modern clades of animals evolved at least in their basic form within five to ten million years after the KT event. So about 15 million years ago in Chimere when the hadrosaurs the ceratopsids and the tyrannosaurs largely went extinct. There's relic populations of each clade that still remains. Parxosaurs seemed to me to be a really good candidate for a massive adaptive radiation. These were very small, very adaptable animals. They weren't hyper-specialized. They could burrow so they could hide from danger. And they seemed to have had a pretty adaptable diet. And so to me, I thought, wow, so when this big opportunity came up, I thought it would make sense for them to undergo this big adaptive radiation. So some of them went, uh, kind of doubled down on their burrowing. Some of them became very cursorial, very fast animals to fill the niche that the ornithomimosaurs had occupied. And others became wetland specialists, much like a lot of the ceratopsians had been. And so that was why I decided to have the parxosaurs be such a monumental presence in Chimere is that to me they represented a perfect candidate for a massive adaptive radiation. Apart from the two giant crocodilians, the Zhen and Hanzhou,
Are there any other crocodilians that can be dangerous to humans? By the way, it's me, NRD23456 from Twitter. Hey, you were the winner of my 1,000 follower commission giveaway. I drew a irritator with the colors of your own OC irritator, which is a, a type of Spinosaur dinosaur. I'll post the picture there-ish. It's great to see you here. Thank you, man. Um, uh, two giant crocodilians? Yes, there are about a dozen different crocodilian species in Chimer at the moment. I don't have a lot of them in the southern part of the known world, because generally that is seasonally cold enough that crocodilians are not all that comfortable. Um, but there are some, you know, there. I think I have two species of caiman in Picardia. And then the Seritic wetlands have a tremendous amount of crocodilian diversity. So within the known world, those are the two biggest ones. But there are also a bunch of different smaller crocodilians that are absolutely dangerous to people. It would be very interesting to know if there are any other species of hominids and what happened to them if so. If there were other extinction events like the one that ended the reign of the tyrannosaurs. So there are several different species of hominids that I plan on doing a whole video on the different Chimeran human species. The Chimerans, as I refer to them, are descendants from Homo sapiens that came through the portal and populated the known world around 400,000 years ago. There is also several species descended from Homo erectus that came through the East Asian portal almost two million years ago, and perhaps a Neanderthal descendant, although I think I ended up deciding that they went extinct. And then the first children are one of these Homo erectus descendants, which were extremely technologically advanced, uh, but did go extinct about 10,000 years ago for reasons currently unknown. Did the dynastic extinction affect the entire world, or does the outside world have tyrannosaurids and hadrosaurids managing to still be prevalent dominant clades rather than the megaraptorans and parxosaurs taking their place? So the eastern continent, as well as the known world, uh, is pretty devoid of tyrannosaurs and hadrosaurs. Most of these went extinct and are now replaced by a uh, great diversity of Parxosaurs, Megaraptorans, Bellosaurids. Um, a lot of the horned dinosaurs did kind of bounce back in a way that the Hadrosaurids and Tyrants were not able to. Don't say that about my <laughs> favorite dinosaur. Uh, so in my announcement video, I made fun of Nanotyrannus. Sorry if that's your favorite dinosaur. Um, I have seen compelling evidence in either situation about the validity of our good friend Nano Tyrannus. Um, currently, the scientific community seems to have a general consensus that Nano Tyrannus Lancensis is a juvenile of Tyrannosaurus Rex. I do find the idea of a small tyrannosaur in the Hell Creek formation very compelling. It makes sense that there would be a bit of a uh, variety in the tyrants that you see there having a sort of mesopredator makes a lot of sense. But that niche was also occupied by juvenile tyrannosaurs. It's, it seems that they took many years to reach adulthood and that sort of build was very successful worth them sort of stunting their growth and enjoying that period of time that they were about 20 feet long and very rapid predators. And in fact, the idea of Nanotyrannus being a sort of neotenic morph of T-Rex is not supported by any evidence that I'm aware of, but it was kind of what inspired the Orotaku uh, Megaraptoran, the idea that uh, Megaraptorans came to Picardia and didn't become megatheropods, they retained that sort of gracile build to be very successful there. Why are dinosaurs more dominant than mammals on Chimere, and why did sauropods survive the dynastic extinction? Wouldn't large animals like sauropods die out in a mass extinction? That's a good point. So I decided to maintain dinosaurs as the dominant terrestrial organism in Chimere because 
at no point in the Mesozoic did mammals outcompete dinosaurs in their own game, so I thought it made sense to have that continue to be the case in Chimere. Um, during the dynastic extinction, there was a huge drop in the average body size of dinosaurs, so that was how mammals in the known world, at least, have been able to become competitive, because they were not coming through as opossums, they were coming through as hippos and rhinos and able to kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the dinosaurs in a lot of niches, which I thought was a, a, a way for mammals to become successful was to come through leveled up, as it were. As for the sauropods, titanosaurs specifically, it mostly comes down to their adaptability and their method of reproduction. They dumped a ton of eggs and left them to their fate. So while many of the other dinosaurs had intensive parental care, may well have been the source of their untimely demise, the titanosaurs were able to, sure, they lost a tremendous amount of their larger members of their population. Many of the large species of titanosaurs went extinct, but the smaller ones were able to bounce back largely because they could just dump a bunch of eggs and not care. Um, and it also seems that titanosaurs in particular were very, very good at spreading around the world and colonizing different regions, areas that might have enough food for them to carry on. The clade that contains Alamosaurus, for example, has three different dinosaurs in it, all on different continents within the same five million years or so. So it suggests that even without land bridges, these animals were able to swim and populate new areas. And that, to me, sounded like an excellent adaptation for an animal in Chimere. Um, and so that was the key to the Titanosaurus success, that yes, the giants went extinct, but the smaller sort of Saltosaurus-sized taxa were able to spread around, and then as soon as the climate stabilized, about half a million years after the extinction event, they started getting huge again and doing what they do best, which is have a ton of babies and shape the world to their liking. They're part of why Chimera's climate stabilized after the mass extinction. Do you have any cold regions like mountains or tundras? I have several mountains in the known world to the north, kind of along the crescent where the Empire is. There is a big old mountain range there. Picardia has two large mountain ranges that form sort of a, a basin in the center of the southern portion. Um, and as for tundras, yes, not in the known world. Uh, to the south, there are many vast stretches of sort of taiga forests that are very cold. But again, that's not in the known world. There, there are very few places in the known world that experience any kind of snow. And that's mostly the southern islands and the southern coastline of Picardia will occasionally get some snow, but nothing on a glacier level. Do you have an almas in your world? I'm just a boy, standing in front of the internet, admitting I have no idea what this means. Oh, it's a cryptid. In Mongolian folklore, the Almaz, among other variants, is a creature or deity said to inhabit the Caucasus and Pamir Mountains of Central Asia and the Altai Mountains of Western Mongolia. Alright, so it seems to be similar to the Yeti and Bigfoot. Yes, I have a possible descendant of Paranthropus in the forests north of the Empire that will fill a similar role, um, uh, but I might actually be giving that to a bipedal species of baboon, so that's not officially canon yet. I haven't finalized what that creature will be, so... I'm not sure is the answer to your question. Chimere is something I'm still developing. How do shapeshifters work in your world? So, 
Shapeshifters are people that have some of these endemic life forms of Chimer in them, and these endemic life forms have the homeobox genes of humans and another animal. And so they can switch their host from a human to the animal that they have the homeobox genes for. Homeobox genes are the thing that um, <laughs> tell the body as it's developing how to develop. It's still genetically a person. You're still human, but you have the ability for your body to basically manifest as human or as a wolf in the case of Torold in my final short stories, Echoes of Laughter. So in short, you have the ability for your body to physically present as a human or as a certain type of animal. Are there any D&D style magic users in Chimere, i.e. wizards and sorcerers? Additionally, would you ever want Chimere to be adapted into a tabletop RPG setting? Yes. Hell yes. I have been working a little bit in the background on how I would make a setting for Chimere as an RPG. That's a role-playing game for those who don't know, kind of like Dungeons and Dragons. The people who use magic in Chimere, magic being the endemic life, inhabiting their host, and manipulating their environment, typically the power level of these witches and sorcerers in Chimere are going to be kind of on par with, at most, maybe a fifth level character. So, generally, Chimir is not a place that you're going to get god-tier characters. So I don't think Chimir would actually translate well to Dungeons & Dragons. I tend to see it as a scaled-down version. Um, so I would, I'm really feeling a desire to create my own system for it. All right, it's time for the speed round. When the Chimerian water buffalo gonna drop? Soon. Not necessarily a question, but will you ever make videos about specific antagonists? Yes, I have one planned on the demons of Chimer, and I will probably include some of my villains in the character profile videos. So stay tuned for that. One thing and one thing only, Sebosukia. Ziphosukia, Notosukia. The crocodilian diversity in general on the eastern continent is much higher. You're going to see more of these sort of terrestrial crocs. I don't know about those clades specifically. The eastern continent is still pretty underdeveloped, but if not those, then a lot of animals that convergently evolved similar body plans. Have the flying therapsids colonized other places similar to how pterosaurs did? So the flying therosophalians, yes, uh, they are actually fairly recently evolved on the Permian Island, um, but they have started to, the Vanyu is the only one that's made it to the known world. Generally, they are short-distance flyers that use their flight in prey capture. They're not overseas flyers. The Vanyu actually came to Bicardia, via floating vegetation similar to how New World monkeys populated South America. Do the people of Chimere love to hunt, and do they like to hang the skulls or do taxidermy? Yes. Hunting is a very popular sport in many Chimeran cultures. There is generally a sense of reverence and respect, so you're not going to see a lot of trophy hunting in Picardia, for example, outside of collecting a token of your bagini, which is kind of a patron spirit. But in Qajar, in the Free States, and in the Empire, absolutely, you're going to see a ton of sports hunters and people going out trying to catch and kill very impressive large game, and of course displaying their trophies after acquisition. Are tapirs a thing in Chimere? Um, maybe. There's a lot of wetlands that I think they would do very well in, and there are potentially points in history that they coincide with a portal, but I haven't finalized any tapirs yet. Did Homo sapiens and Chimere go through similar stages of social development as those on Earth? Yes, there's a lot of convergence in their culture development as they have resources to do so. That's just something humans do. 
What is the most dangerous creature in Chimere? To humans, probably the large cats. The lion and leopard are notorious for developing man-eaters on Earth, and that is the case in Chimere as well. And a lot of these large cats live in the same regions as humans. So they are consistently the biggest threat to humans in Chimere. What was the extinction that killed the Tyrannosaurs like? Uh, it was a combination of volcanic activity and a change in climate uh, that initially impacted their prey items and then impacted themselves. How many species are there in Chimere? Oh, I mean, it's a whole planet that's slightly larger than Earth and also has the added benefit of having an influx of our own species to Chimere. So I would say maybe 20% more species than we have on our own planet, but I obviously haven't mapped them all out yet. I have, I think, 300 canon fauna at the moment, although I don't, I think maybe half of them have profiles. So, hard to give this question a very particular numerical answer. Do any modern Earth governments know about Chimere and what does Chimere think of Earth? So there is an organization called the Assembly uh, in Earth in the setting of Chimere uh, that is in charge of kind of keeping Chimere a secret, along with beings like witches and shapeshifters uh, because of the persecution that these beings have gotten in the past. And Chimere thinks very poorly of Earth. There is uh, this perception that Earth is, the, I mean, they call it the plague lands because when they brought our livestock to Chimera through trade, they got a tremendous amount of diseases and they blamed it on humans rather than the livestock. And so there is this kind of xenophobic perception of Earth as being this place that is diseased. And on top of that, in the past hundred years, we have poisoned our planet. We have gone through several world wars that there were times where more people died every day in World War I than many of the nations in Chimere had. So we are fucking terrifying to the people of Chimere, and they want, for the most part, nothing to do with us. Can you do a video on the flyers of Chimere? Also love your videos. Thank you so much. And yes, a, a video on the flying clades of Chimere is something that I have in the works as kind of a general overview of the birds, the pterosaurs, the flying therocephalians, and bats, and then bugs. Insects will be included in that in some capacity, although I have not actually made any insect profiles yet, so that's something I'm going to need to work on uh, to include in a few stills in that video. Besides the Vanyu, have other animals from the Permian subcontinent immigrated to the known world? At the moment, I just have the Vanyu and then the Mogao, which is a sort of walrus manatee-looking dicynodont. Um, I plan on incorporating a few more, but for the most part, the Permian subcontinent is very distant from the known world, and so these are creatures that have come to Chimere either by swimming or by... Uh, hopping on vegetation and floating across the ocean to the known world. What is your creative process for new clades and species in Chimere? Typically, it's looking at points throughout Earth's history and deciding what makes sense for organisms in this time period to come to Chimere, how might they adapt. If they're hyper-specialized to a context on Earth, they're probably going to go extinct. R.I.P. Pandas. And if they are an adaptable animal that happens to coincide with the timing of a portal, they will likely come through and be able to find some niche. If there are no niches available for an apex predator, your animals coming through can either adapt or die. That's what happened with the saber-toothed cats. Uh, they were not as adaptable as the likes of leopards and lions, and they were not able to take over the role of apex predator from theropods that were often 
20, 30 times larger than them. So oftentimes animals that come through that are specialized die out. So if it's an adaptable animal, I will think, okay, so how can this animal either stay in the niche that it's in, like the leopard, and just kind of go after any small prey items that it can then drag into a tree, or how might they adapt to fit a new niche? If I may ask, when do you plan on making a video about the Megaraptorans? That is also on the queue for very soon, probably within the next two or three videos. I'm working on developing more of a Megaraptoran portfolio. So once I have a lot of good artwork for it is when I will be putting together that video. All right, thank you all for tuning in. That was a lot of fun. Good for me to get out of my scripted comfort zone and relax a bit. In the comments below, please let me know what sorts of aspects of this project you would like me to cover in videos going forward. I've got a bunch of video ideas, but I would like to start covering subjects that specifically interest you all. Thank you all so much for participating. This has been a really cool opportunity, a really great chance for me to get to know what you guys are interested about in this project. That is all for today. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Until next time, cheers, folks. Hi everybody, this is Hemingway. Say hi Hemingway. Fair enough.